And welcome, friends, to another edition of our Treatment of the International Sunday School Lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, Faith to Persevere. And it's for December the 17th, 2017, Winter Quarter Lesson Number 3. And it's taken from, from Acts the 14th chapter, verses 8 through 11, and 19 through 23. Now, a little quick background information. This is uh, relating to, it's a story of, uh, taken from Paul and Barnabas's um, missionary journey where they have went around and they were called out and went from town to town and there had been uh, several um, periods of persecution that had occurred as they were going around. There were a lot of contention with the Jewish synagogues uh, as Paul was preaching and teaching and proclaiming the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and preaching the having saving knowledge and putting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there had been a lot of persecution uh, during this time period. Okay. Now this is taking up in Acts 14, 8 through 10. Now at Lystra there was a man setting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and never had walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, and he sprang up and began walking. Now, we want to point out a few things here. First off, this man was crippled from birth. He had never, ever walked. And the second thing we want to point out is it's as the Bible talks about, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, we see here where this man was listening to Paul speaking the word of God and telling him uh, about the Lord Jesus. And Paul looked in, at him intently and he sees that faith was beginning to spring up inside of him and that he had had faith to be healed. And the Holy Ghost prompted Paul to proclaim to the man with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. And this man, miraculously, for the first time in his life, sprang up jumped up, and he began to start walking. Okay, the 11th verse. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now, we see here where these are all pagan people. And they have seen this miraculous event. They all had known this man who had never walked a day in his life. And they now see him walking around. And so they immediately ascribe deity to the missionaries that were there. And just a couple of side statements I want to make is that it is true that that would not happen in 
a modern evangelical church, one that took the Bible seriously and the people were reading the Bible. They wouldn't go around hollering that their preacher is a god. But we do see this happen oftentimes when people are, uh, they get us some fame to them. They um, uh, get a lot of success in their church. Their church grows phenomenally. Uh, a lot of people are saved underneath their preaching. Uh, they do a lot of good works. Uh, they get to be a really, really skilled speaker, a brilliant theologian. And they, people begin to put them up on a pedestal and speak more of them, more highly of them than they should. And let me caution everyone uh, under the sound of my voice about this. Because you can trigger a failure in your pastor or in that evangelist by putting them up on too high on a pedestal. If they get bloated up and they get prideful and think more of themselves than they should, that it will always trigger a fa some kind of failure where they will fall flat on their face. See, the Bible is very plain about one thing. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. That's not one time. That's not some of the time. That's not part of the time. That is all the time. God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And if you contribute to building someone up in a in pride to make them think more of themselves than they should, you are contributing to their downfall when you do that. Now, I'm not saying treat your pastor like a dog. I'm not saying that. And show respect to whom respect is, is, is due. And honor to whom honor is due. Now, that's, that's real clear that the Bible teaches that. But don't build people up to where they're superhuman and just contribute to them being very narcissistic and egotistical. Okay? Now, there's discussion, this, we've skipped a little bit, but that discussion is of the different uh, Greek gods that they might have potentially um, tried to ascribe to Paul and them. Um, but that's what those verses basically is talking, those verses in between these are basically talking about. But the 19th verse says, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, it's important for us to really get a good grasp of this thing about stoning. Stoning is an extremely brutal form of execution. And they had done this brutal form of execution to the point that they believed the Apostle Paul was dead. And they drug him out threw him out of the city because they didn't want him stinking up the streets because they thought they had killed him and they left him there supposing that he was dead. Now, there is... You can make all kinds of conjectures here at this point. Uh, we've already seen in the Bible how that God 
had raised people from the dead during this time period. That was an event that that happened. Now, it is possible that they actually, when they stoned Paul, that they really did kill him. That they were really dragging a dead body out of the city and leaving it off in the rubbish heap and it really was dead. And Paul was really dead at that point. It could have been they just injured him so bad and he was completely unconscious and just hanging on by a thread at this point. It can also be that uh, this was the point of time where Paul was possibly uh, had his out-of-body experience that he talked about in the later epistles. There's no telling. We, we, you know, we're we're just guessing when we try to make those things. But there is one thing about it: is that this man was beaten badly. They stoned him horribly because they stoned him to the point where they thought he was dead. They thought they had killed him. Okay? Now, first part of the 20th verse, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. This is obviously a miraculous event that is occurring here. There he is, His pulse rate, he was either dead or his pulse rate was so feeble and faint that people presumed and assumed he was dead. And the disciples gathered about him and he was raised to his feet and he entered the city. Last part, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Now, it's important to note, this is where we know that this is a very miraculous thing that has occurred here. Because Derby was about 60 miles away. This trip was not a trivial trip. It is not like Paul went to the stumbled to the house next door. He got up the next day and went on a long journey on foot with Brother Barnabas. So we know that he was miraculously raised at that time. Now, whether or not he was being raised from the dead or raised from this being beat senseless, but there was a miracle that occurred here for him to be strong enough to travel all the way to Derby. Okay? The twenty first through the twenty second verse, and when they when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of of God. So we see them kind of backtracking from where they started from and they come back through and they are the people they had won to the Lord. They begin to disciple them and teach them and encourage them and to show them by example how to live a godly life, and how to endure tribulation, and to be an encouragement 
an encouragement to these new Christians. Okay, the 23rd verse, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting they committed them to the Lord, in whom they had believed. So, once they had, uh, when they came back through, they appointed the leaders of the church and had a time of prayer and fasting for these people so they could grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And notice here that he that it as always in the Bible how that it is plural. They had appointed elders for them in every church. It is important to have more than one person in charge in a church. It is not supposed to be a one-man show. It is supposed to be a group of elders who are in charge and hold each other in accountability and the church holds them in accountability and they hold the church in accountability. And that way... Uh, you don't have these little fiefdoms springing up uh, inside the house of God. It's important to make sure that things are done in decency and in order. And it's important to make sure that we are going about working for the Lord for the right reasons. And it's important that you don't have uh, dictatorships. It's important that you have accountability. There needs to be a balance in everything. Okay. Now, a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, First off, We have, the church has always had periods of persecution. Now, we need to be real careful. You know, if, um, if you, let's say for example, and I've seen this happen. Let's say for example, you get a job and All you do on your job is go around witnessing on your job. You don't ever do your job. And your manager comes back around and he fires you. That's not persecution. That's not, that's just real simple, not doing your job. Okay? If, if, you're talking with somebody and you invite them to church and they say, well, I I ain't going to go and you reach over and smack them and the police come and get you and you get charged with smacking somebody, that's not persecution. That's just being too silly. That's being so silly that you think you can get away with smacking somebody. Okay? Persecution is the person comes after you and does horrible things to you only because you are a Christian and you haven't done things to trigger that. You haven't stolen from them, you haven't defrauded them, you haven't um, smacked them, you haven't uh, taken a job that you didn't work hard at, Uh, you just, um, you just 
are getting persecuted only because you are a Christian. And that's going to, that is going to happen. And when it does, always remember that the church has dealt with persecution. Your brothers and sisters before you for generations and generations has had to deal with this. And all you can do is to do this in a spirit of love and in a prayerful time. Pray for the persons, the people who are persecuting you, who are de- despitefully using you, and just pray for them. Well, friends, good Lord willing, we'll be back with you next weekend. So you tune in again for our treatment of the International Sunday School Lessons.